Hello, everyone. This is another episode of Unisolve Law YouTube show where I interview interesting people, mostly lawyers. And today, for sure, I have one of these very interesting people for you. Her name is Karima Saad, and uh, she's a lawyer here in Toronto. She is quite known uh, also through her marketing, uh, which we'll also talk about. Uh, really interesting. Without further ado, uh, Karima is the best person to introduce herself. Hello, Karima. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's my I, pleasure. I, yeah. You know what? I'm, I'm just going to dive right into your, uh, the origin of your career path. I want to talk about your career path a little bit because I'm so sure that there are a lot of uh, law students or people who just got called to the bar or young lawyers who would really benefit from lessons that you learned uh, on your career path. I think your career path is fascinating. So let's go right back to Ottawa. And my God, it's Ottawa again. This is the third interview in a row that I interview someone from Ottawa or went to school in Ottawa or somehow is connected to Ottawa. And you know what? You went to school in Ottawa. Like you really went to school in Ottawa. <laughs> I'm looking I, I at your stuck LinkedIn in the city. Profile. I loved it there. <laughs> so let's talk about this. Um, why did you choose University of Ottawa and why did you do Bachelor of Social Sciences, International Development and Globalization? Uh, summa cum laude, by the way. Pardon uh, so my Latin. <laughs> <laughs> I was born and raised in Mississauga. Um, so part of my motivation in going to Ottawa was getting far enough that, um, you know, I, I would be, there's no question about it. I have to live on campus. I can't commute six hours a day. Um, so, so that was one aspect of it, but really um, I had been doing French immersion from kindergarten and Ottawa U was one of the few universities that offered French um, sort of as a component to the degree. And they were quite flexible in the way that um, students can do that. So I was able to sort of select the courses that I felt comfortable with in French and kept it up and, and the city itself, of course, being so close to Quebec and being the capital, um, lots of opportunities to practice kind of on a day to day basis. So that's how I ended up in Ottawa. And then I stayed there because I just really loved the city. Um, I liked the people I liked sort of the flow of things and um, Ottawa U, of course, has I think a great representation, obviously lots of interesting people coming out of there. Um, and I, I signed up for the joint JD MA program. So I wasn't really sure about law and figured that would be a way to kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, as it turned out, the law side is, is more um, what, what sort of drove my career path. That's right. Uh... So let me just switch to this view. So, but before you chose to go to law school, you chose to go to the undergraduate program in social sciences, international development and globalization. This is the name of your undergraduate program in, uh, at the University of Ottawa. Why uh, ID, why globalization, why social sciences? I liked that it was an interdisciplinary program. So I think maybe one of the themes in my career trajectory is indecisiveness um, and kind of wanting to experience different things because I'm not 100% sure um, about jumping into any one pond. Um, so that degree was a mix of economics, history, political science, um, and of course the international development aspect. Um, throughout high school and maybe even earlier than that, um, sort of social justice and global issues were always on my radar. Um, so I thought that this would be a good entry point, maybe, um, you know, when I initially started, I, I had fantasies of ending up at the UN um, and was quickly disillusioned um, from that career path. Um, but it, it's actually how I also um, ended up wanting to do law because in my third year, I did an internship abroad. Um, and I, I was placed in India at an organization called the Human Rights Law Network. And that was my first exposure to lawyers. And I mean, obviously, I had seen lawyers in the media, 
Um, I didn't know any in real life. And the type of work that they were doing um, really aligned with my interests. And they were doing sort of individual cases and making a difference um, for, for those clients, but also doing broader public interest stuff. And, and you know, one thing that really struck, uh, struck me and stuck with me, um, one of the, the lawyers there, she, she explained how she ended up doing law. And it was because she wanted to know how the system works in order to affect change within the system. And I think my, my views on that have evolved a fair bit um, since that internship experience, but it holds true that, that everything we do is affected by law in some way or another. Um, so I knew that law school and, and the way that it trains people to think um, would be sort of the transferable skill um, and a tangible skill that um, while my degree in international development equipped me with a lot of analytical thinking and all that fun stuff, I, I couldn't really say that I had a particular skill set. Um, and so that's how I ended up doing law. But you hedged your bets and uh, you also did uh, an MA in parallel with the JD and the MA was also in international relations. Uh, did your uh, undergraduate experience in India inspire your MA dissertation? Very much so. Um, so I, Tell I us wrote, about that dissertation. Well, I, I wrote about um, a, a situation of ethnic cleansing that occurred in Gujarat. Um, so a pogrom um, in 2002, I guess. Um, and so, so disclaimer, I actually, I finished the dissertation. I never presented it. Um, the research material, like I, it really affected me in like a really deep way. Um, and I ended up just not following through with it because the material was so heavy. Um, so I talked about how sort of sexual violence was, was a tool, a specific tool um, that the government used and, and how um, they, there was like themes of, of nationalism and the use of religious iconography and, and how that um, sort of framed people's thinking. Um, so, and then connected it to the idea of restorative justice. And after sort of a scenario of ethnic cleansing among neighbors, where, you know, that there are, are all sorts of th theories and explanations how the violence came to pass. Um, and of course, the, the man who was at the head of the state is now the prime minister of India. And that was something that was happening at the same time as well. And that was just the most disheartening thing. Um, so yeah, it, it was, I pulled together all sorts of ideas um, and it's actually a really fascinating paper uh, if anyone ever wants to read it. Um, and I got to swear a fair bit um, in the title and just generally, um, so, so that was maybe an outlet, um, but it, it infused sort of idea of art and how, um, you know, from a constructivist perspective, um, how what we're presented with and what people consume, um, how that affects thinking and then actions. Uh, and, and it's been sort of a trip watching, um, you know, what's happening in the United States because there are a lot of similarities and parallels that can be drawn um, from sort of the use of propaganda and how that translates into actual physical violence. Um, so, you know, to sum it up, the, the, the basic idea was that ideas sort of shape actions, which is a very, um, you know, obvious thought, but uh, I really delved into the, the patterns and how that happened. Did you think that law could be a solution to those terrible problems that you came across uh, in your undergraduate program and in, in your MA? That was another disillusioning part of, of writing that paper. Um, and in fact, in, in, in many of the cases of the most extreme violence, um, it ended up being the victims who and who were jailed um, because they either recanted their stories or um, 
you know, I, I, I won't delve into the specifics here, um, but, but it had a very perverse effect. Um, and what did become clear is that sort of systems and institutions, um, you know, they're only as good as, sorry, that's my cat. Um, they're only a, as good as, as we maintain them and keep them and the people that we put in those positions of power. Um, so I wouldn't discount law as um, a, a solution, but um, certainly the way that um, we conceptualize um, sort of a carceral system or a retribution based um, system of punishment, um, when, when you have that level of violence and it's between neighbors, um, you know, I, I don't think that criminal law is, is the solution or the answer. Was law school everything you thought it would be or was it completely different from your expectations? My expectations were shaped in large part by Legally Blonde. Um, so I, I will say that it didn't live up to everything I hoped for, um, but I, I enjoyed my time in law school overall. Um, and, and, you know, a benefit of being at Ottawa U was just the, the wide selection of courses that were available. So again, I got to dip my toes um, in, in various fields. Um, my experience was a little bit disjointed because of the MA. So I started with one cohort and then graduated with another. Um, and, you know, so, so that uh, maybe shaped my experience a little bit. And I will say, um, when you stay in the same city that you did your undergrad in, um, I, I guess I thought that the, in some ways it made the transition smoother. I didn't have to move or learn a new city. Um, but a lot of sort of the routines and friends that I had from undergrad, uh, you know, they moved back to Toronto or they moved elsewhere. So it was um, a weird sense of it being familiar, but then also very different. Um, so, so that was, I mean, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change it at all. You summered an article with Lansner Slat, right? We all know what Lesnar Slat is, at least all of us in litigation. Would you say that you have litigation blue blood? <laughs> you know, I, uh, I like the way that you phrase that. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, obviously my time there was um, limited to summer and articling, um, but I had exposure to some of the best litigators in Canada. Um, you know, and even in the most recent Canadian Law Awards, um, they were recognized as the top litigation boutique, and that's not the first or the last time um, that, that they will get those kinds of accolades. Um, so I was so fortunate to be in that kind of environment, just sort of soaking in the knowledge. What is the best lesson that you took away from Lesnar Slat? In litigation, but you know what? If you don't want to give me a litigation lesson, fine. But I'm a <laughs> litigator, so I'm doing it for me. <laughs> that's no, that's, that's a fair question. Um, I guess it would come down to sort of strategy and tying that to client objectives, because there may be sort of a legal route to pursue, and that might be a tried and true method, um, but really listening to client objectives, because sometimes they're not looking for um, kind of the, the legal outcome. There are, I wouldn't say collateral interests, but um, it, 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 it might not be purely based on the, the court outcome. Um, and so being sensitive to that and attuned to that um, I think is, is super important. And it's been something that I carry uh, into my own practice today. They are mostly known for their civil and commercial litigation work. And I'm talking about Lesnar Slat. Why did you, when you started your own practice after articling, why did you go into criminal law? It turns out I don't really like um, civil or commercial litigation. Um, so the stakes are high, obviously, um, as far as monetary considerations go, um, but it wasn't something that I felt connected to um, in a way that drives me. And so criminal law um, and housing law, which um, is sort of the, the offshoot and my main area of focus now, um, you know, the, the impacts are very real um, on, on people's lives. Uh, and, and that 
um, that drives me, that fuels me. Well, why didn't you join as a recent call or as someone who is just called to the bar? Why didn't you jo join one of those criminal firms? Uh, I'm not very familiar with that world, but uh, I, I think, you know, th there were some opportunities probably, especially for obviously brilliant person such as you looking at your background. That's a good question. Um, I don't know that I was ready to be in a firm environment. Um, and if I were to do things, uh, you know, my, my original sort of life plan um, definitely did have me at a firm for an extended period of time to, to learn more and observe more and, and all of that, uh, have that mentorship. Um, but, but truthfully, I, I spent a few months after articles um, contemplating whether law was really the path that I wanted to pursue. Um, so again, that indecisiveness. Um, and I spent time in courtrooms, just hanging out, observing, watching litigators at work. Um, and, you know, through that made some connections, um, you know, friends in the lawyer's lounge, so to speak. Um, and someone actually referred a case to me. Um, and I didn't have a firm at the time. I, I wasn't really looking. Um, and I just had this landlord tenant matter plopped in my lap. And I said, okay, let's give it a go. Um, and I liked it. I liked being in charge of the file and uh, having access to mentors. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's, it's my decision making. Um, and you know, maybe that's a lust for power. I don't know. Um, but, but I liked it. Um, and the, the advantage, I think, um, and, and sort of how my career is playing out so far, um, that autonomy means that um, I really get to be authentic um, in how I present myself um, and what I do um, and the clients I work with and the clients I don't work with and, you know, what I get to say about myself on social media or, or otherwise. Um, and that's something that understandably, you, you have to um, give up some of that autonomy when you're in a firm environment because you're not just thinking about yourself. Um, so, so that uh, once I started on that path, it, it was like, a I guess, a rock kind of rolling down and just gaining momentum. Um, and, you know, I haven't stopped yet. Um, but, you know, things always change, circumstances change. So, uh, I'm not discounting that possibility in the future, uh, but for right now, I'm having a good time. Well, you're having a good time. And uh, you said earlier that civil and commercial litigation didn't drive you. You've now had your own firm for a few years. You've had a good time for a few years. Did you find what drives you? What is it? <laughs> I didn't realize this was going to be so soul searching. Um, <laughs> well, okay, so on, on the one hand, um, sort of having real tangible consequences arising out of a case um, where, you know, not to say that money's not real, but in a lot of ways, money's not real. Um, but someone's liberty or um, someone's housing or someone's ability to stay in their community or their city um, that's very real to me. Uh, and so making those connections with people, um, you know, that, that's something that, that fuels me. Um, I will also say that kind of on maybe a, in a bigger picture sense, um, my experiences with clients give me insight and perspective into public policy making. Um, and having been in Ottawa, always in the back of my mind was floating the idea of working in policy, um, sort of designing the rules that that shape how how we function. Um, and I haven't actually ever worked for government. Um, but it turns out that critiquing policy is even more fun. Um, so so that is is something that I enjoy doing. And um, has become a very important part of my practice. Um, so acknowledging when things are done right, um, but also being a voice to um, either sound the alarm or uh, raise just concerns um, about decisions that are impacting people. And, you know, I get to see on the ground um, how that actually plays out. And, and then 
um, make my case uh, through the media. So media has been um, an important part of, of my work. You said that one of the reasons for having your own practice is being authentic, being your true self. Uh, you, you want autonomy. I, I, I interpret this as basically when you say that you lust for power, uh, I think lust for power in general is underrated. Uh, more people should lust for power in their own lives, having more autonomy over themselves in that sense. So when, when, when you said that you had lust for power, that you wanted autonomy, I understood it as your desire to uh, mm -hmm. express yourself fully and to fulfill your potential fully without the constraints of an organization designed by others, right? Perhaps many years ago, perhaps in a completely different context. So how did your law firm allow you to express your true self and to be authentic? I, I like that charitable interpretation and I'm gonna roll with that. That's great. Um, <laughs> I think through my marketing is probably the number one way that I get to express myself um, as who I am. Um, so, I mean, it started with something small, um, my business card that has my, my face on it. And, you know, it's a cartoonified version of myself and, you know, give it to you and okay, you're gonna remember hopefully um, who I am and what I do. And if you need me for that purpose, you'll give me a call. Um, and then that kind of, that, that, that grew um, because I, I was able to connect with someone who, um, who could take my ideas and then translate them into uh, exactly what I, what I was envisioning um, into art. And so um, that started with um, a comic series like Landlord Tenant 101, uh, where it was just expressing basic rules that everyone, landlords, tenants, um, should be aware of um, in a way that I think was accessible to people. Um, and, and this has really, it's like an extension of the work um, that I've always done um, and access to information as a means to access to justice. Um, I, I mentioned that I was with the Human Rights Law Network. Um, one of the projects I'm most proud of um, is we, we created um, a cartoon, um, like a comic book that uh, explained uh, the recent domestic violence legislation. Um, and so that was back in like 2010, 2011, and I sort of shelved the idea, um, but in my mind always thought about art as a means of sort of conveying information. Um, and that's something that I was able to do because I could say, okay, uh, my firm is going to allocate resources for this purpose and, you know, it's providing content and value to people. And if it takes off, great. If it doesn't, um, at least it's something that I wanted to do and I can say I'm, I'm proud of. Um, so, so I think that that's um, probably the, the main way that that's manifested. Um, and, you know, being on my own also allowed me um, when the venture election um, you know was happening in 2019 um, I was able to say okay I'm going to give it a go um, and that's maybe not something that I would have had the flexibility or luxury of doing um, in a firm environment um, but because I managed my caseload I was able to reduce it to some extent and focus on that task at hand uh, and I think that even though uh, it didn't pan out and I'm not on convocation, um, the, the connections and friendships that I made throughout that process um, were so significant um, and, and really make the law world a friendlier place for me. Um, so, I mean, a difficulty has always been finding my place in law um, and finding somewhere that, that I fit in. Um, but it turns out you can actually just sort of carve your own space and then um, the, the people who are like-minded and who are supportive of that um, will, will find you and will help boost you. Um, so, so that's been sort of a fret, like a, a pleasantly surprising aspect of, of the law world. Um, I think we're frequently portrayed as being super competitive and very cutthroat. Um, and, and that's probably true to some extent, but it, it hasn't been my only experience in law. 
You know, speaking of authenticity, I identify you with two things. Among others, besides brilliance, for example, or eloquence, I identify you with comics and with billboards. So in this city, um, when I think of lawyer billboards, I think of two kinds. First, personal injury lawyers. We all have seen those. And the second, uh, Kareem Assad's billboards. So you're one of a kind, right? Uh, sui generis. <laughs> Who makes your fantastic illustrations? I mean, I have to have some trade secrets. Um, so so <laughs> I, I'm not the illustrator. Good. I'm the conceptualizer and the writer and yeah. art director. Um, and I outsource that work um, within my mm -hmm. office. Um, so so I'm, I'm so fortunate to be surrounded by talented people. Um, and that's probably, um, you know, the number one piece of advice I could ever give. Um, just surround yourself with smart people and good things will happen. Because if you... Uh, are insistent on being the smartest person in the room, um, you know, that that's maybe good for the ego, but not um, good for your growth. And uh, just circling back to kind of lessons from Lenzner, um, that was one of them. Like you, you're in a room of, of pure brilliance and like, it just, it's humbling, but also inspiring. Um, and, and that's something that I've carried on and, and just, um, always making an effort to to connect with people who who are bright. Well, I still want to pursue the illustration and billboard uh, topic because I just think it's so brilliant. Whose idea was to do comics? I, I want to say that that was my idea. Um, and I mean, that's how the the human rights law network like domestic violence comic series came about um but you know it it was something i wanted to do right from the start um hence my my business card and it took several years to get off the ground um so you know the person i'm working with now was not the first person i went through many many people um who i sort of tried to build that connection with and you know, it, it didn't quite produce the results I wanted. Um, so th that's always, I mean, I wouldn't say that I set out in law in order to make law comics, um, but it was a very natural extension for me because um, I've always loved art um, and art in many forms, but visual art in particular. As far as I know, you created an illustrated guide to the law in even as early as your time in India, correct? So tell us a little bit about that. What, was it the precursor to what you're doing now? Was it something similar? It, um, it was similar um, in the sense that it kind of broke down step by step, um, sort of, you know, what is the eligibility? Who is covered by this act? Um, what must you do in order to avail yourself of, of rights? What types of rights might you be entitled to and and where do you go to access that um so so those were the basic topics that were covered in in the comic series um and you know the idea there um was that literacy was was often a barrier to people um kind of accessing information right so pamphlets that were heavy in writing um weren't necessarily useful to the the target demographic um, so, I mean, even like, it, it's very hard to get away with no writing when you're dealing with a legal issue and, you know, a, a, a limitation of comics is that um, there's only so much nuance that you can introduce. And um, obviously, when you're actually applying a law, there's a hundred what ifs and depends on and so on and so forth. Um, right. So, I mean, it's not a perfect medium, um, but literacy issues were actually the, what, what sparked that particular idea. Um, and, and now I would say that, um, you know, there's also, I, and I'm not a scientist um, or a sociologist, so take this with a lump of salt, um, but speaking to my own experience, like my attention span isn't 
always great. Um, and it's maybe because we're constantly saturated with information and, you know, coming at us from all angles. Um, so I find that drawing or comics are a way to sort of get a point across in a way that is digestible um, compared to maybe a, a lengthy blog post or um, something along those lines. And I've tried blogging as well. And, and I have blogs that accompany comics in order to um, get that nuance across, but um, kind of being mindful of who my, my target demographic is, um, you know, if, if art speaks to them or they can get the necessary information, um, then we're in good shape and I've done my job. Interesting. I want to ask you a question about India. I know that India is a popular destination for tourists, for scientists, for students. In your case, was it a random choice or did you go there for a reason when you were an undergraduate student? Um, it's a good question. Uh, so my, my mom is of Indian descent. Um, so uh, prior to my undergrad experience, um, I had traveled to India twice uh, and like thoroughly enjoyed myself um, in that experience. Uh, and, and we did sort of like a road trip um, across, you know, well, not the whole country, it's too big, um, but, you know, across a, a good chunk of it. Uh, and I, I really fell in love with everything. Um, there's so much culture, like a richness of culture, of history, um, and the, the way that people sort of receive you, like the sense of community, um, and I'll, I'll like just an example, um, you know, in, in Canada, it's kind of inconceivable that um, you would have a family with a, with a young child um, taking a trip on the via rail, and then both parents ask a stranger like, hey, can you watch my kid for a few minutes? I'm just going to go like, whatever. Um, and that was so normal there. Um, and, and in a way where it was kind of, I wouldn't say like a naive trust in people, right? Like, you're maybe triangulating and asking more than one person, but like that willingness. And, and here, I think, you know, it would be seen as a pure liability and like, no, I'm not watching your kid, like watch your own kid. I'm going to call CAS right now. Um, and, and that's not the attitude there. So that's just like one example out of uh, a million examples of sort of the, uh, I just a sense of community um, that, you know, and I don't want to romanticize or glamorize because obviously there are sort of other other issues. Um, but but I, I liked that that culture. Uh, and so when I was sort of narrowing my, my options and choices for, um, you know, where I would like to go, um, that was like top on the list because, you know, I, I, I feel like a personal connection um, to the country. You know, I think one of the risks of being stuck uh, in uh, your own country all the time is completely missing that there are shocking differences between uh, your country's culture and uh, other co countries' cultures, both good and bad, and both uh, between cultures that are distant from each other and between cultures that are considered to be related. So there are shocking differences between uh, some European countries and cultures there, for example, and what people are used to here in Canada, right? Just to take an example of countries that are supposed to be more related, right? So it's, it's really dangerous to miss out on, on that insight when you all focus only on your own home, in my humble opinion. So in that respect, you mentioned Indian descent. So you have Indian descent, right? Uh, through your mother. Uh, you may have other cultural backgrounds as well. In today's Canada, is it appropriate to inquire into other people's cultural background, uh, ethnic background, racial background? Is it an appropriate thing to do? And if it's an appropriate thing to do, is it, is it even maybe valuable, right? And how to do it right? 
I think how to do it right is the sort of operative question there, um, because it, it really depends on context. Um, and so, for example, like I, I threw out law school, I was a waitress. Um, and, you know, one of the most grating questions was, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Mississauga, but, you know, I moved to Ottawa for school. No, like, where are you really from? And okay, there's a lot of assumptions that are packed into that seemingly innocent question. Um, in contrast to uh, where you're building a relationship with someone um, that's more maybe long term, and part of that inquiry is, oh, okay, you're from Mississauga, cool. Um, you know, uh, what's your what's your cultural background or, you know, and, and again, that even that question can be loaded. Um, so it depends, like, you know, when is it being asked? Why is it being asked? Is it in sort of a casual conversation? Is it where um, there's give and take? What's the power dynamic in that question being asked? Has the asker themselves maybe revealed something of, of their own background? And perhaps that's a better introduction than just pepper someone um, with questions sort of assuming that they can't be Canadian because you know brown people have been in Canada since like the 1800s right um, not my family in particular but um, you know there's many multi-generational um, people of, of Indian descent so you know I, I think that it can be done right and, and I do believe that there's um, potential value depending on how the information is used right if it's a way to build camaraderie or understanding, that's a good thing. Um, if you then are making assumptions, oh, she's Muslim, so, you know, she's not even going to be allowed to shake my hand. So, uh, you know, but like, you know, so, so it, it I, I don't know that there's a right answer, but uh, certainly things should be done in a way that's not just tactful, but also um, kind of sensitive. Um, and, and not in a way that makes someone feel like an outsider. Um, but by the same token, right, oh, she's Muslim, maybe that means that I, I'm not just going to have alcohol at this reception, I'm going to have non-alcoholic options too. And, and then, you know, she may or may not drink, I don't know. Um, and, and, you know, so, so it, it can be useful. Um, yeah, I think it can be useful, but it just has to be done properly. And Ugh, that that can be a landmine to navigate. Um, but I, I think that as long as someone is receptive to being sort of gently called out, or maybe not so gently, depending on, on who you cross, um, but but at least open to amending their, their path or, or correcting course, um, you know, no harm, no foul. You know, I have only one critique um, of what you just said. No one says cool in response to an admission that someone is from Mississauga. I honestly, I, I often say Toronto, um, but have been like blasted for that because I know it's not true. Um, and, and that's why I went to Ottawa. So, I mean, I was up front. I was up front. I had to get away. <laughs> uh, look, Karima, uh, there is a lot of complexity at play here. What you described here seemed like a simple example and at the same time it was clear that the perhaps clueless person there at the center of that example was obviously going through um, a struggle mental struggle perhaps because of lack of knowledge or lack of sensitivity and let's assume not because of prejudice right but although Often we come, you know, people come across prejudice, but let's just for a second assume people are not prejudiced, just for purposes of our thought experiment. So, a well-intentioned person, a well-meaning person, uh, but someone who was never exposed to thousands of cultures of the world, right, and that are also present in Canada. The beautiful thing about this country, almost. Pretty much every cu culture in the world is present here in this country. So take this person, fairly ordinary person, not exposed, no knowledge, good intentions, honest wish to be nice, and at the same time, superficial awareness of cultural differences without substantive understanding of them. What do they do 
do they withdraw themselves from this complexity? It is a natural tendency for all people to simplify their lives. And we do that either by giving up, you know, you stop brushing your teeth. <laughs> Life is simpler now, right? Or by um, designing clever uh, mechanisms or tools or techniques, right? So, uh, of course, we cannot expect uh, average person to design clever tools, techniques, and mechanisms. So, the, the natural uh, conclusion then that people will give up because people are afraid of complexity. People uh, shy away from complexity. What is your advice? What is your uh, answer to this dilemma? Or maybe there is no dilemma. Maybe I, my, my assumptions are not sound. So I think, I mean, the first thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? So good intentions aren't determinative of impact. And I think that impact matters more than intention. Um, so my, my suggestion um, is that people approach things that they don't know with humility um, and sort of a willingness to, to learn and to be corrected and not to get your back up because you may have had good intentions and maybe that landed flat and, and didn't, you know, it, it didn't achieve the objective that we were hoping for. Um, but it doesn't mean you you give up and retreat and now there is no point in trying to communicate with anyone who isn't like me because I got burned that one time. Um, I, I think it's a, a willingness to be corrected and, and you know, for myself, um, you know, I don't think anyone is born um, sort of perfect and savvy in that way. Um, so humility is, is important in, in a lot of interactions and uh, you know, what I learned in high school and maybe undergrad compared to in law school and then in real life about um, Indigenous people and, and um, sort of the, the many nations that exist and even like the nomenclature, getting a hang of that um, and, you know, how do you um, respectfully sort of ask some, like, how, how, how do you broach that when there's you know, such a loaded history and, and I get it wrong sometimes, um, but, you know, a, a willingness to be corrected and to learn. Um, and I think, you know, nowadays there's no, like ignorance isn't um, as valid an excuse because we have sort of the world of information at our fingertips. Um, so one thing that has been um, helpful for me is um, when, when I am, mindful that I don't know something or, you know, there are, yeah, issues that I, I just am not attuned to or, or familiar with. Um, Twitter for me has been an excellent tool um, in terms of following people who um, are maybe from that, that, like from different nations, for, so just back to Indigenous people. Um, so getting like a, a range and diversity of perspectives, but then not sort of jumping into conversations and saying, hey, can you explain this for me? Like Googling it yourself, right? And, and being more of a listener and not having to center yourself and your feelings, um, because that's not actually what is always the most important thing. Um, so recognizing that and then just being willing to, to be an observer and not the one who is the center of attention, um, whether or not that is your, your intent, um, again, impact over intent. Um, so, so I think that there's, you know, if someone's concerned about, um, you know, issues of diversity and how do I navigate this without offending anybody, like follow and listen and learn and be mindful of whose voices you're, you're listening to and, and get as wide a range as possible. Um, and you might not agree with every perspective and that's okay because there's diversity within diversity, right? Like there's no monolithic group, um, but uh, being sort of willing to challenge your own assumptions, um, I, I think is invaluable. And, and you're right that, that a lot of people will shy away from that complexity and it is what it is, uh, but the, the benefits of 
engaging and pushing yourself and pushing those comfort boundaries, uh, I think is, you know, it, impossible to, to overstate. Do you think the uh, monocultural communities that we uh, have here in Canada, whether in exurbs or in the suburbs or in, inside our cities, are evidence that for the most part or in large, uh, uh, people in large, to, large, to a large extent, people do choose the wide road to, of, of extracting themselves, of simply staying away from this complexity. Because frankly, we have to, we have to acknowledge that you are equipped with number one, your natural talent and brilliance. And number two, with, I would say, eight years of formal education across three degree programs. And number, number three, your international experience in India, right? And number four, your family exposure, because you didn't have a choice, right? So you have these four tremendous advantages and uh, we have to acknowledge that these advantages give you the tools to, to speak the things that you are saying right now and to make conclusions that you're making right now. But if we look around us, except maybe some parts of Toronto that are really mixed, we, I, maybe I'm wrong, but don't we see this escape into monocultural communities? And isn't this evidence that people are choosing the extraction, the self-extraction rather than dealing with the complexity? And uh, is it as the problem? If yes, what do we do about it? Hmm. I mean, I guess I don't, I don't know that I have the data to sort of answer one way or another. Um, but I think there's probably a distinction between um, nurturing one's own culture and community through sort of gatherings that are kind of your space and um, that are familiar and maybe nostalgic, but also renewing. And, and there are spaces that aren't meant for everybody to be a part of that space, right? And, and I think that that's okay. Um, but where there's maybe more of a problem is um, if you are exclusively interacting, um, you know, within that bubble, um, it, it goes back to what you were saying earlier on that, that you lose sight of the fact that things you take for granted um, as sort of natural truths, um, you know, that that's not the case for everyone. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's really limiting your own exposure and, and growth. Um, and, and without a doubt, um, I, I've been very fortunate and I'm well positioned um, to sort of have this conversation that we're having and still I get it wrong sometimes. Um, so, I mean, probably many times. Um, so, so, you know, I, I don't think that the standard is perfection. Um, it I can't be, but it, it, going back to sort of a willingness to learn and to be corrected, um, that that's, that's all really anyone can ask. And, and I know that um, just in my own experiences, um, you know, sometimes people will be quick to call for a cancellation, so to speak, right? And you did that, and so that's bad, and, you know, you're not a good person anymore. And I think that that's unhelpful um, and counterproductive. Uh, but, you know, you will, you will never please everyone all of the time. It's impossible. Um, so, I, I mean, a focus on kind of your immediate surroundings and making sure that the people you are interacting with are, you know, happy to interact with you. And if they're not, like, is there, what should I be doing differently? And, and kind of not assuming that, not making assumptions um, and, and just asking questions. So, I mean, I think anyone and everyone is equipped to ask questions um, and, you know, it's maybe more of a skill to discern like when it's appropriate to ask those questions versus like using Google because a lot can be 
achieved through Google, we have that advantage over previous generations for sure. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if that answers the question, but it's not impossible to navigate. And I mean, formal education sure is, is helpful um, in some respects, but in others, I can see that it in itself becomes sort of a barrier because, well, I'm educated, so I know this. Um, and you know, you get entrenched in your positions. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, th there's people from like small town, rural um, Canada who, you know, are, are some of my favorite people to, to interact with. Um, so I don't think that it's necessarily a cosmopolitan thing either. Like, and you know, it's not just race or culture, right? There's all sorts of divisions like class, what's your socioeconomic background, what's your family structure, like so many things, you know, did you grow up in an apartment or a house or a, a, a farm and like that changes sort of your own experience, right? Like I, you know, I, I didn't have to do the types of chores that someone growing up on a farm would have to do, like, and, you know, I, I don't know where I'm going with this, but the point being, um, you know, it's just like, we, we can, I, I don't want to do like a kumbaya, like it's not maybe that simple, um, but I'll, I'll repeat that uh, approaching things with a humility and just a willingness to learn, um, I think that that goes a very, very long way. Karima, I crave part two of this conversation. I seriously do. I know I've already encroached on your valuable time and uh, can can we agree to come back and talk about these things again oh it's a deal for kind of, sure this was like this is fascinating a morning reflection i didn't expect to have but like this is <laughs> a very stimulating conversation thank you thank you for having me you know what uh, i really enjoyed listening to you i hope i didn't talk too much today and uh, I'm just going to have more questions next time because I want to get more material into my ears. It's really interesting. And um, I want to say thank you on behalf of all of our viewers and listeners, on behalf of myself. I am really the first reason why I do this because I'm learning from all of these people that I meet with and I, I listen to. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and I will definitely get back uh, uh, on scheduling uh, part two, we should do it. And uh, have a fantastic day. It's a beautiful Friday today in Toronto and uh, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much.